Hello, welcome to EPG Pathshala. I'm Aparna from IIT Bombay and I'm going to talk to you on module uh, of small towns governance uh, which comes under paper of sociology of urban transformation. Uh, this module introduces the conceptual shifts in governance and how they have been applied to small towns. The module also discusses the emerging issues uh, that are linked to the same. Governance refers to the framework of arrangements that are employed by society to take decisions and enact policies about the conduct of public life. It is thus a critical process that involves politics, laws, management, administration and several dynamic interplays between civil and political society. Governance thus is a concept that moves beyond the government to also understand the government society interface. The Indian constitution has an explicit commitment to the encouragement of Panchayati Raj as part of the directive principles of state policy. Governance of large cities uh, has evolved under the tutelage of British colonial power and then under the influence of post-independence ideas of urban management. However, small towns present a special case of governance with their intermediate positioning in between rural and urban areas. There have been significant shift in assessing the merits and demerits of decentralization at the level of local. So let's discuss what does the governance mean. Governance refers to the framework of arrangements that are employed by society to take decisions and enact policies about the conduct of public life. Uh, it is thus a critical process that involves politics, laws, management, administration and several dynamic interplays between civil and political society. Governance uh, thus is a concept that moves beyond the government to also understand the government society interface. The Indian constitution has an explicit commitment to the encouragement of Panchayati Raj as a part of the directive principles of state policy. Governance of large cities has evolved under the tutelage of British colonial power and then under the influence of post-independence ideas of urban management. However, small towns present a special case of governance uh, with their intermediate positioning in between rural and urban areas. There have been significant shifts in assessing the merits and demerits of decentralization at the level of the local. Small town governance in particular uh, is characterized by significant ambivalence. The shifting contours of this debate give an insight into the, into the scalar shifts in Indian politics and the character of its public institutions. And in this, role of caste, class and gender becomes very significant. It becomes significant in shaping the socio-economic structure of the small town. It also shapes the local state and its workings. The dynamics that result from the interface of the local state with practices that are sought to be introduced by current day reforms are interesting and represent multiple possibilities. The shift in governance, which is also called new public management, that essentially reconceptualizes the role of state to be that of facilitator. It articulates several processes that may be implicit in earlier governance processes and legitimates them. Bringing them to the foray has enabled the emergence of new governmentalities in that ways in which state envisages and operationalizes its relationship with various entities in society. These include public-private partnerships, stakeholder consultations, participative policy making and influence of external parties on the exercise of power. Several development agencies, including the World Bank and UNDP, began to articulate the relationship between governance and development. The World Bank, in 1992, thus defined governance as the exercise of power and authority for the management of a country's social and economic resources. The concept of good governance was thus born. Good governance was indispensable if project objectives were to be met. The characteristics of good governance were transparency, accountability, efficiency and good management practices. This was then revised to include decentralization in a bit to make governments closer to people. 
decentralization was a program that was actively pursued by the UNDP, which saw transparency, effectiveness, accountability, participation and equity as the major parameters of good governance. This advocacy of governance programs by these eight agencies meant their large-scale adoption across several countries. The outcomes of such programs vary, but the legacy of good governance and the emphasis on the facilitative role of the state remains. There are several critiques of the shift in governance. Grindel, for example, points out that the concept of good governance is a good idea. It had been conflated to deliver growth, reduce poverty, and deliver effective democracy. Pensey critiques the assumptions in the concept of good governance because for him, it assumes the presence of civil society with an expanded public domain where there are few contestations and there is dialogue between the various elements of society. On the other hand, even citizenship is contested in India and the relationship between state and various elements of society may be downright conflictual. In this context, notions of partnership may deepen some of the cleavages. Nanda, for example, points out to the insistence of governance as enforced precondition by the World Bank and other influential actors and the incursion of a monetary agency into a political terrain. Jayal points out that the role of a state in the new dispensation is confined to making rules that enable markets to work and to compensate for market failures. Founded in a tradition of liberal democracy, good governance seeks to universalize certain values which may not do justice to the historically produced and hence specific traditions of democracy in several developing countries like India and actually eliminate politics. Harrison concludes that the outcome of several interventions for good governance in Africa has been to actually weaken the state instead of enhancing its capacities. Practices of new public management have been incorporated into the Indian state in an increasing manner since the 1990s. One of the most interesting shifts in the move towards decentralization while in the 73rd and 74th constitutional amendments, which gave a constitutional place to the third tier of government, that is, local government including panchayats and municipalities. Let's talk about the shift that happened in governance a paradigms of a small town. There are three distinct phases in the discourse around small town governance in India. The constitution does not make any explicit reference to urban governance or local governance in urban areas. It makes a commitment to Panchayati Raj in rural areas and, uh, and though many small towns may be block or district headquarters, they are not treated as part of the rural governance system. Uh, on the other side of the settlement spectrum, municipal institutions are a legacy of the colonial government in its structure, form and their function. They have op often found themselves uh, unable to deal with the challenges of the post-independence period that brought in new democratic forces and confronted bureaucratic supremacy. The post-independence Indian state treated decentralization of urban governance with suspicion so uh, municipal bodies and local politics could be very narrow-minded, parochial and preoccupied with self-interest. The Indian system thus shifted towards a centralized system. Uh, govern governments of urban areas they were subjected to arbitrary and long suspensions. There was a parallel formation of bureaucratic uh, in entities and that performed critical functions. Uh, in the 1990s, there was an attempt to shift towards a more decentralized mode, uh, a shift that largely remains incomplete even now. In the most current phase, the governance model is being corporatized. That is, local government are expected to follow operative principles such as uh, management of revenues, finances and assets akin to private sector companies with citizens as, as their customers. The discourse of uh, uh, urban, urban governments is replete with ambiguity. It comprises various mixes and, and legacies of uh, these three phases as well as their hopes. 
so this is also reflected in the terminology uh, that that are used uh, to define urban governance small town urban, urban governance urban local bodies uh, that are essentially emphasizing their lo uh, localness in a uniform disembodiment manner. City governments, uh, that are governments that have control over all the city uh, affairs. Municipalities, uh, uh, which is an institution, uh, form and legacy. There have been significant shifts in how the role of small towns has been conceptualized by policy. The Urban Rural Relationship Committee 1966 prescribed rural industrialization with a shift, shift of industries from cities to regions and efforts to decongest cities uh, with the vision to create more harmonious development. Next, the National Commission on Urbanization advocated an explicit spatial strategies to facilitate urbanization. Small towns were seen uh, as the intermediary nodes between the rural and the urban. However, uh, these intentions rarely translated into efforts to plan small towns or upgrade their resource availability. Rather, they were efforts to control them through state level interventions. And in the JNURM regime, too, small and medium towns re received a relatively resistance to being urban. The constitutional amendment has envisaged the architecture of governance, which included the formation of Nagar Panchayats for transitional areas and municipal councils for intermediate sizes of towns. The experience of several states is that many towns eligible to have Nagar Panchayats or municipal councils actually are not declared as urban areas. The experience of Tamil Nadu one of the only states to declare all eligible towns after the 2001 census as statutory urban areas is eliminating in this regard. Of these 566 panchayats with a population under 30,000 were reclassified as rural panchayats in 2004 due to local demands. There thus seems to be an active resistance to acquiring an urban status. Samantha points out further complexities in the policies of classification. In West Bengal, the population threshold for urban areas higher than other states, that is 30,000. Thus, many census towns continue to be governed by panchayats. Bhidri and Van Gankar, in a study of Maharashtra, identify several examples of contestations around being declared urban, such as Khargar literally hole in between Plan Navi Mumbai and Panvel municipalities, which is still a Gram Panchayat, an active opposition of peripheral villages being appended to corporations in several parts of the state. Powerful elements like politicians, mercantile class and real estate developers prefer the rural status as it offered a space for informal politics practices to continue. Citizens prefer it as there are more rural schemes. Shiva Ramakrishnan concludes that there are few incentives in the system to be declared as urban. This is an indictment of the overall status of small town governance. Issues of coordination Urban local governments are a part of the overall system of small town governance. There are several issues of coordination across varying state institutions. Varda Raju, for example, points out that in Karnataka, the district planning systems are quite powerful and these plans are prepared without the integration of urban plans. Further, while larger cities have developed more autonomous governance system, smaller cities and towns continue to be governed under the rural governance framework through offices that are ill-equipped to deal with urban planning issues. Their requirements are thus neglected. Samantha makes similar observations in the case of West Bengal. Karnataka, Gujarat, Maharashtra, West Bengal and Kerala have local government systems that are well institutionalized and yet small towns suffer neglect. In the case of states like Uttar Pradesh, where most functions are even more centralized and technical capacity exists only in state level institutions. Coordination is an even greater issue and the municipal 
government is not seen as a significant institution. Perkigol and Gauda observes that there is a competition between these government agencies and suggests that this, this may be linked to the technical organizations being dominated by higher and educated caste, while municipal governments are dominated by relatively lower castes. Performance and Service Delivery Several studies point out that the level of services and amenities declines as one moves down the scale of settlements. Kundu et al. show up the disparity of amenities across sides and scale is greater in states like Bihar, Orissa, Madhya Pradesh, Kerala and Uttar Pradesh. Further, they argue that while there was an important improvement in levels of infrastructure in class 1 town, in these states in the period 1981-1991, the levels of amenities in smaller scale towns had not improved. Sharma, who visited the seven small towns in North India, conquers, she observed that the level of services in these towns is extremely poor, hampered by poor finances, rich and the poor alike in these towns face severe shortfalls in services. Management of solid waste presents an area that illustrates these difficulties. In Mirzapur, cycle rickshaws are used to transport waste, more than half of which find themselves back on the roads. In Janjigir, where even cycle rickshaws are not available, men pull handcarts to transport waste. The experience of solid waste also extends to the other areas of functioning. There are several issues of wasteful expenditure and lack of planning. Thus, Sharma reports how the concrete was laid out in part of a road making. The road several feet higher than adjoining houses in Madhubani, Rajnathgaon and Sihor. A road cleaning machine was bought in Janjigir at Rs. 45 lakh to clean the own one and only road in the town. The performance and delivery of services at small town level is thus poor. The question is can. Can this be seen as solely linked to the local government themselves? Is this reflective of a broader culture of public institutions in the country? Does this need to be seen in the light of funding opportunity and grant structures that direct funding to predetermined ends instead of supporting local government articulation of needs? Or does this need to be seen in connection with the structuring of grants for single and predetermined purposes to which local governments need to hitch programming? Are these local government? The last tire which the least pass be held solely responsible for services that are generated through a highly centralized system. Capacity Issues Poor capacity is often cited to be the core reason for the low levels of service delivery and performance of the local governments in small towns. Poor capacity has multiple meanings, low levels of own revenue, shortage of qualified human resource and poor management capacity. Sharma says, President of Janji Giras saying, then their revenue source are fixed and limited to property tax, mandi tax and water tax. Further, the earnings from these are limited. These limits in places where there are no industries or beyond taxes severely constrain the ability to, of small towns to invest in capital expenditure like infrastructure. In fact, many of them find it difficult to pay the salaries of their employees too. And the issue linked to poor finance is the dependence on grants from state governments to the tune of 70% or more. The area that is most affected in terms of performance is dealing with poverty. Small towns are often the first birth of rural migrants. Studies show that a bulk of urban poor are located in small and medium towns. However, local bodies in these towns have little funds at their disposal for dealing with the issues linked to poverty. Issues linked to capacity of small towns are highly interconnected and therefore vexed. For example, there are few employees in Chandrapur Municipal Council in Maharashtra as revenues are low and the rate of revenue collection is low because there are few people to go door to door and collect revenue. While the current funding patterns assume that the local government are expected 
to be implementing the 18 functions envisaged by the 74th constitutional amendment. These functions are not completely transferred to the local governments. State government institutions such as planning directorates, water and sewerage boards, development authorities, housing boards wield a lot of power. Funds and functionaries are also not allotted in due proportions. On the other hand, partial programs of administrative reforms have further undermined the human resource capacities of small town governments. Critical posts have been abolished or not filled. Based on a study of four towns in Uttar Pradesh, Burkigol and Gauda conclude that the differences in service seen in these cities have related much more to decisions of regional governments than to the performance of the municipalities. The issue of capacity, while important, is thus grossly distorted, pointing out to the need for a more comprehensive analysis of our design for decentralization. Democratization Studies of the local, state and small towns are few. A study of 1967 general elections in a small town in Uttar Pradesh by Khadija Gupta documents the influence of caste and class in these elections in spite of the town being part of reserved constituency. Bahabha Harris White has taken undertaken longitudinal studies of a small town called Arni in South Asia. Her observations are the local state extremely insightful. The features of her observation of this local state are that there is a significant overlap in the actors in the state apparatus and civil society. The role played by non-official but powerful people is important. Private status of officials is important as well. The resources of these local governments are receding and its financial affairs are characterized by fraud and tax evasion. The local state is thus embedded in a framework of accumulation that has a wide base. It mentions both public and private resources and serves to protect the interest of an agrarian and mercantile capitalist class. Accumulation for which the state becomes a conduit follows contours of caste and gender, albeit with limited spaces for new groups to consolidate and emerge. Barki and Gaura concur with these observation point out to the principal actors in municipal policy largely comprise local landlords and businessmen, public work contractors who see municipal power as a source of rents from commissions and tenders for public service and seek to monopolize it. Democratization is limited and constrained in this context and reflects shifting strategies of these coalitions to maintain power. Studies of local politics in small towns of Maharashtra reveal an emergent pattern of coalitions across ideologically disparate parties. In Sangli, Miraj, Kupwara Municipal Council, thus the Nationalist Congress Party has formed a coalition with the Bharatiya Janata Party Shiv Sena and the Jamaat Islam. This pattern is prevalent in several small towns such as Pimpri, Chinchwad, Ambarnath, etc. Another pattern is the following out of the former local state in terms of resources and responsible governance. This has been done through a takeover of several key decision-making areas from the local government such as taxation, appointments and oversight and performance of local bureaucracy. Thus, even the introduction of gender quotas in electoral representations as a step towards democratization of politics fails to make a dent in the patterns of accumulation or in terms of creating a space for hitherto neglect groups. So let's summarize what we have learned in this module. Small town governance in India has been the victim of ongoing policy shifts and an inadequate consideration of local capacities, politics and resources. Even the current regime of decentralization and reforms does not give the due uh, importance to the extent of decentralization of resources and capacity in the system and adopts uh, the approaches that are peaceable. So the current state of governance is dismal due to this. There is no doubt that decentralization is necessary but uh, there is a need to give far more comprehensive thought to the overall framework of governance. Uh, to understand small towns as distinct sites and initiate an overhaul and reform of the system 
and not just at the bottom but also from the top and intermediary uh, that at stage level is the necessity.